Welcome everyone to the final day of our workshops. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, I'm Sarah Wernicke. I'm the Tax Incentives Program Coordinator at the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office. The session is being recorded and we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So you can add, so please put them in the Q&A section and we will get them. If you need continuing education credit certification, please leave your email in the chat and we will get those to you. So before we actually get to the case study, let's just briefly go over the highlights of what the Historic Preservation Tax Incentive Program is. In a review from yesterday, the National Park Service, or the NPS, administers the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentives Program with the Internal Revenue Service, or the IRS, and in partnership with the State Historic Preservation Offices, or the SHPOs. The tax incentives promote the rehabilitation of income producing historic structures of every period, size, style, and type. Through this program, underutilized or vacant schools, warehouses, factories, retail stores, apartments, hotels, houses, offices, and other buildings throughout the country have been returned to a useful life in a manner that maintains their historic character. The Historic Preservation Certification Application is a three-part application that is used to apply for that used to provide apply for certifications required for the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentives. The MPS certifies whether a building is a certified historic structure and whether a rehabilitation meets the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation and is consistent with the historic character of the building and, where applicable, with the district in which it is located. 20% income tax for the certified rehabilitation of a certified historic structure at the federal level. And in Oklahoma, we follow the federal process. So once you qualify for the 20% federal credit, you automatically qualify for an additional 20% credit at the state level for a grand total of 40% dollar for dollar that is taken over the next five years after the project is complete. Only depreciable properties can qualify for the tax credits, meaning income producing properties owned and operated by for-profit entities. So now, Let's get into a case study and we will start with some general statistics on the building and the project. This is Benedictine Heights Hospital. It's located in Guthrie, Logan County. The years built was from 1926 to 1948, with the start of the rehabilitation being in October of 2015 and completed in April of 2019 with a date of certification in October 2019. Its original use was a tuberculosis hospital that was ran by the Benedictine Sisters. The new use is low to moderate income apartments, 52 units, 36 units in the historic building, and 16 new units in adjacent new construction. The estimated total project cost was $13.5 million, with the estimated qualified rehabilitation cost being $7.5 million. This meant that the property owner or the applicant received $1.5 million in federal tax credits and additional $1.5 million in state tax credits for a grand total of about $3 million or just over $3 million in tax credits to offset the cost. So here are just a couple of comparison photos. The image on the left is how the building looked circa 1950, and the one on the right is when the project was completed in 2019.
Here are some more comparison photos, but this time the image on the left was how the building looked in 2015 when the project started, and the one on the right is when the project was completed in 2019. The building was in fairly rough shape, especially in the upper floors. So now let's see how we got from a derelict building to a building that people want to live in utilizing the historic preservation tax credit. And this project started with a part one and a National Register of Historic Places nomination. Use the part one to request certification that a building contributes to the significance of a registered historic district or a national register property with more than one building and thus a certified historic structure for the purposes of the 20% rehabilitation tax credit or for easement donation purposes. Or use the part one to request a preliminary determination of individual eligibility of whether a building is individually is an individual building not yet listed to the National Register might meet the National Register criteria for evaluation of whether a building in a potential historic district contributes to the significance of that district of whether a building outside the period or area of significance of a registered historic district contributes to this to the significance of that district if the building is neither within a registered historic district nor individually listed in the National Register, the owner must submit a Part 1 and begin the separate process of requesting the SHPO to nominate the building or the district to the National Register. Please note that if the property is a single individual is a single building individually listed in the National Register of Historic Places, it is already a certified historic structure and a Part 1 is not needed. A Part 1 is required for all other properties, including individually listed properties that have more than one building. Since this property was not yet listed to the National Register of Historic Places, the Part 1 was used as the preliminary, preliminary determination of eligibility. As such, a draft National Register nomination was prepared and submitted with the Part 1 application. Lucky for us, the information needed for the Part 1 is the same as the information needed in the draft National Register nomination. It is literally a copy and paste. These are the part one application components. The form, the signature page, the form, the write-up, which records the description of the physical appearance as it is today and any changes or alterations that occurred over time. It also includes a statement of significance. This will be the same for the draft National Register nomination. Maps are really important and are required in the Part 1 application. One being a boundary comparison map that compares the boundaries, the historic property boundaries, the current property boundaries, and the project boundaries to make sure that they are either the same or different, and it's okay if they are different. We just need to know what all encompasses the project and what all encompasses the historic and the current property boundaries. This is especially true for um, functionally related buildings or properties within a historic district. Sanborn fire insurance maps are always good. And Google Earth images and historic aerials if they are available. If you can find historic photographs of the building, great. But sometimes it can be difficult or they just don't exist. We will need photographs of the building or buildings if there is more than one building on the property 
as it was for this project. The few photographs required should show the current condition of the building or buildings, both on the exterior and the interior, and be properly labeled. The typical photograph set amount for a part one application is about 10 to 20, depending on the complexity of the project. The part two will require additional photographs to document the entirety of the property, so don't worry about providing everything all at once. These can, and typically are, the same photographs that are submitted with the National Register nomination, if applicable. On occasion, the applicant will not yet own the, pro the subject property. When this is the case, a letter of affidavit from the current property owner must be submitted acknowledging that they are aware of the undertaking and consent to it happening. This is the part one for the project. It included a fully filled out signature page or page one, which contains the basic information about the property, including the name of the property, the current address, indication of whether or not the property is currently listed in the National Register, who the project contact is and their information, and who the applicant is and their information. The property name ought to be the historic name of the property or the address if it does not have a specific name. The write-up and the subsequent continuation sheets matches what is in the draft National Register nomination submitted with the application and includes a physical description of the property as it was at the beginning of the project before work began. It also describes any known alterations that have occurred over time and their approximate dates. It also includes a statement of significance or historic narrative of the property that explains why the property is historically significant. Remember that just because something is old doesn't necessarily mean that it's historically significant and vice versa. Because the property was not listed, was not yet listed to the National Register of Historic Places when the project started, a draft nomination was prepared and submitted with the Part 1. Again, the draft National Register nomination ought to match the Part 1 application and includes a physical description of the property as it was at the beginning of the project before work began. It also describes any alterations that have occurred over time and their approximate dates. There's also the statement of significance or historic narrative of the property that explains why the property is historically significant and within a particular context. The historic preservation consultant prepared the various documents and worked with the National Register of Historic Places program coordinator on the National Register listing and the tax credit program coordinator on the tax credit applications and process. Along with the application and nomination, a supplemental information document was put together that compiled the various maps, historic images, and any pertinent news articles for consideration and comparison. The satellite image on the left shows the property as it was at the beginning of the project. The image in the middle is a copy of the Sanborn Fire Insurance map from 1948 that shows what the property looked like and was composed of at that time. The image on the right is a historic aerial image taken from 1937. As you can see in the 1937 image, the main building was more of a U-shape with a west wing that had been demolished by 1948, as illustrated in the Sanborn map. Another difference between these two images is the addition of the laundry or boiler room auto house building to the north of the main building from 1937 to 1948. 
Comparing these various images and resources gives a better idea of the evolution of, of the development of the property and the area around the property as evident in the increased development of the surrounding neighborhood. Historic images and photographs are always a great find if you can find them. Fortunately for this project, the property was historically owned and operated by the Benedictine Order and the archive of the St. Joseph's Monastery in Tulsa, Oklahoma was the repository of all the records from the nuns in the hospital and they never threw anything away. This meant that there were more historic images and documentation than is typical of buildings of this vintage, which included news articles, reports, artist renderings, and historic photographs of both the exterior and the interior of the buildings. A set of photographs documenting the current condition of the property before work began. The photographs were extensive and covered the building and covered the buildings on the exterior and the interior and from the basement to the roofs. In total, there were 185 photos submitted to fully document both buildings. Please note that these photos were that these photos were taken also were used for the part two documentation. For an, initial, for an initial part one, no more than 20 photos should suffice and only 10 photographs were submitted for the National Register nomination. Accompanying these printed photographs were photo keys that depicted the site and floor plans with photo tags indicating the location and photo of the photograph was taken and what direction the camera was pointing. Also on this photo key are colors indicating the results of a space analysis describing the level of importance of the various spaces. Lobbies and main circulation spaces are considered primary spaces here shown in blue and as such, those spaces need to maintain a higher degree of historic integrity and less alteration. Versus the spaces considered secondary, shown here in red, being the individual patient rooms, restrooms, utility and other support spaces, which can support a higher degree of alteration for the new use. The green spaces here are indicated as being primary spaces, but are less important than the main spaces and are reserved for secondary circulation and reception areas. Basically, it has to do with what degree the general public had access to. One of the neat things about documenting this specific property was because we had historic photographs of the interior and exterior, we were able to get similar photos to show how much or little the building had changed in that particular area and what the historic materials and finishes were and if they were still extant. An example of this is with the old emergency room entryway on the back side of the building. An important aspect of every project is the official correspondence between the applicant or consultant and the SHPO or MPS. This project did require a letter of affidavit from the legal property owner as the applicant at the time of the initial submittal did not own the property. The affidavit acknowledged the proposed undertaking by the applicant and consented to it. Detailed cover and transmittal letters are important to keep track of what got submitted to whom and when. So once everything was submitted in a format that was complete and acceptable, the State Historic Preservation Office reviewed the submittal, 
issued their comments and recommendation to the National Park Service in pink for their review and official determination being the formal letter on the right. The SHPO's recommendation was submitted on May 23, 2017, and the Park Service approved the Part 1 on June 23, 2017. So now the part one has been approved. Let's look at the part two, which describes the proposed rehabilitation. The part two describes rehabilitation work to be undertaken on the property and must be completed by all applicants seeking the federal income tax credit for the rehabilitation of historic properties. The Part 2 will not be reviewed by MPS until the Part 1 has been filed and acted upon, even if you submit the Part 1 and Part 2 at the same time, unless the property is already individually listed to the National Register, in which case you don't need a Part 1. Applicants are strongly encouraged to submit applications describing proposed work and to receive approval from MPS prior to the start of work. Owners who undertake rehabilitation projects without prior approval from the MPS do so at their own risk. Proposed work will be evaluated using the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation and 36 CFR 67.7. Conformance with the standards will be determined on the basis of the application documentation and other available information by evaluating the property as it existed prior to the start of the rehabilitation work, regardless of when the property becomes or became a certified historic structure. The standards apply to both the interior and exterior work, and the MPS reviews the entire rehabilitation project, including any attached, adjacent, or related new construction on the property. The standards are applied in a reasonable manner, taking into consideration economic and technical feasibility. Certification is based on whether the overall project meets the standards. To be certified, a rehabilitation project must be determined to be consistent with the historic character of the building and, where applicable, the district in which it is located. The Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation take precedent over other regulations and codes in determining whether the rehabilitation project is consistent with the historic character of the property and, where applicable, the district in which it is located. The first page of the form must be the actual official cover sheet and must be filled out in its entirety, bear the applicant's original signature, and must be dated. The other sections on the subsequent pages provided may be expanded as needed or continued in another format, like a Word document, just as long as the information required is given. If the statement was submitted with a previous part of the application, a duplicate copy is not required. Send architectural drawings or sketches showing the existing conditions and the proposed rehabilitation work and any new additions or new construction. Include floor plans and, where necessary, sections and elevations. Dimensions and notes must be clearly legible. For small projects, sketches may suffice, but drawings must be numbered and keyed to the application narrative. I will go ahead and say that depending on the level of um, complexity of the project or the property, um, the amount of information 
both verbally and uh, or in the write-up and in um, drawings may be different from project to project. So if the property, if, if MPS comes back and asks you for additional information that you may not have had to provide on another project, it may be because that particular project was less um, in, was less complex than what you have, than what you're working on now. Send photographs showing the interior and the exterior before rehabilitation. Include the building site and environment, all sides of the building, all major interior spaces and features, and representative secondary spaces and features, including areas where no work is proposed. Photographs need to be labeled with specific information to include building or property name, view shown, description of view shown, date taken, and photo number. The amount of photos required for the part two will be greater than, than the amount acceptable for the part one. Again, if the applicant is not the fee simple owner of the property or is not the property is or is not the owner at the time of the application within the meaning of owner set forth in 36 CFR 67.2, the application must be accompanied by a written statement from the fee simple owner indicating that he or she is aware of the application and has no objection to the request for certification. This is the part two for the project. Like the part one, it included a fully filled out signature page or page one, which, com which contains the basic information about the property and the project, including the name of the property, the current address, indication of whether or not the property is currently listed in the National Register, who the project contact is and their information, and who the applicant is and their information. Additional information includes the projected project data, which among other things, denotes the number of buildings, estimated qualified rehabilitation expenditures, and existing and proposed uses. On the continuation sheets, each item, feature, material is described separately. First, the item or feature or material that will be discussed is specified as is the date of said item, feature, or material was installed or built. Then, the existing condition of the item is described, followed by a description of how it will be addressed during the project, even if no work is proposed. Between the two descriptions, the photograph and drawing sheet numbers of where we can expect to see where the specific item is featured or addressed is given. This trend is continued until every aspect of the project has been discussed. For the architectural drawings, the bare minimum of drawings that are required are existing and proposed site plan, existing and proposed floor plans, and existing and proposed elevations. Other drawings that are not necessarily required but are highly recommended are existing and proposed building sections, existing and proposed reflected ceiling plans, and proposed mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire suppression system plans. Here are a few existing conditions drawings above with the proposed rehabilitation plans below. Note that in this case, the existing conditions drawings were coupled with the photo key and space analysis. Again, a set of photographs documenting the current condition of the, pro of the property before work began was submitted. Above is the photo image and below is the label on the back of the photograph with the name of the property, the address, a brief description of what the photo is showing, who took the photo, the date that the photo was taken, 
the direction that the camera is pointing and which part the photo was submitted with. In this case, parts one and two were submitted together so it covers both parts. And the photo number that corresponds to its respective tag in the photo keys. Please note that because the part one and the part two for this project was submitted, uh, was submitted at the same time, these photographs were used for both the part one documentation though if the, and the part two, though if the part one was submitted prior to the submission of the part two, only about 10 to 15 photos would have sufficed. Again, photo keys and space analysis that depicted the site and the floor plans with the photo tags indicating the location of the photograph was taken and what direction the camera was pointing were submitted. As you can see in these example photos, the buildings were in fair to poor condition. So once everything was submitted in a format that was complete and acceptable, the State Historic Preservation Office reviewed the submittal, issued their comments, recommendation, and re recommended conditions to the National Park Service in yellow. The SHPO's recommendation, recommended conditions covered concerns with the treatment of the windows, the adjacent new construction, and anything else that had yet to be submitted for review. That last one is a blanket condition that virtually every project who gets conditions gets. The SHPO's recommendation was submitted on September 11, 2017. And please remember that the SHPO's recommendation is just that, a recommendation. All official determinations are given by MPS. So once the Park Service receives the submission from our office, the applicant will receive an invoice from NPS to pay for the review. Please note that the Oklahoma SHPO does not charge for our review, but that is not the case for every state. The National Park Service issued a conditional approval of the Part 2, meaning that the majority of the work was deemed appropriate and consistent with the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation. The Park Service's decision was a conditional approval of the Part 2, but the conditions were not the same between the SHPO's recommendation and the final conditions. The Park Service's conditions covered concerns with the windows, with the windows anything else that had yet to be submitted for review, but instead of having issues with the new construction component, they had issue with the proposed new suspended ceiling tile system. This is an excellent example of why applicants need to wait for Park Service's official decision before starting work. Amendments and phase advisory determinations use the same form. Amendments are used for a variety of reasons to amend previously submitted information. Advisory determinations are used to, clo out, to close out and get credit for a particular phase that has been completed as described in the initial part two and or subsequent amendments. Use an amendment or the advisory determination form to submit information requested by a National Park Service for an application under review and or on hold. Inform, inform the NPS of a change in ownership. Amend a previously, a previously submitted part one, two, or three application and request an advisory determination as to whether a completed phase of a phased rehabilitation project meets the Secretary's standards. To amend a previously submitted application, briefly describe changes to the original application 
and describe in further detail in attachments if necessary. Use these to respond to a condition or inadvertent discovery or any other scenario where a scope of work change is needed to be requested. Make sure that if it is in response to a condition that the information being submitted is what was asked for in the condition. Please note that there is no limit to the amount of amendments in order to achieve a compliant project. We would rather have a multitude of amendments that answers all the questions and concerns and have a successful project than to have little to no amendments and end up with a project that does not meet the standards and gets denied. To request an advisory determination on a completed phase of a phase project, list work items completed in the phase and give the phase completion date. Continue in attachments if necessary. The phase completion date is the date that all work related to the phase was completed. If the phase completion date and the date of the phase is placed in service pursuant to IRS regulations are different, the date the phase was completed is the date that must be reported on the form. The estimated rehabilitation costs of phase must be reported on the form and are defined as the phase's estimated Qualified Rehabilitation Expenditures, or QREs, pursuant to Section 47 of the Internal Revenue Code. IRS rules require phasing plans to be set forth before a project begins in the Part 2. See the IRS regulations for more information on meeting this requirement. The MPS can issue advisory determinations only on phases of a project that have been defined at the start of the project in the approved Part 2 application and only for work completed in that defined phase. This is amendment number one for the project which addressed two things. One was the response to condition number one addressing the windows and the second was to update the address for the applicant. As we can see on the signature page, a brief description of the items being discussed in the amendment was provided with a further and more detailed explanation provided on the subsequent continuation page. Condition number one stated that the Proposed replacement windows much match, must match the appearance, size, design, proportions, and profiles of the existing windows and must have clear glazing. In order to ensure the proposed windows meet the standards, detailed dimensioned drawings of both the existing and any proposed replacement windows showing them in relationship to the wall assembly must be submitted for review. The response states that the proposed replacement windows will match the appearance, size, design, proportions, and profiles as closely as possible to the existing historic wood framed windows. The proposed windows are based on elevations and detailed existing window information collected on site. The proposed replacement window is a single hung aluminum clad wood, one over one window, with some units having a fixed transom unit. See the attached additional information for product brochures, detailed comparisons, specifications, and documentation of a pilot window installation. So let's look at these various attachments. As part of the justification for needing to replace the windows, a window survey was conducted. Here you can see the extent of the data collected for each window in both buildings. An accompanying report that summarized the results and recommendations was also prepared. I will note that um, standards nowadays for uh, requesting window replacements, uh, this is not needed. And I wish that it had been case when I was putting this one together, but that's okay. It's a lot easier now um, with just 
photographic documentation. Um, to accompany the survey, a document was prepared that looked at some of the windows, the ones highlighted in the survey spreadsheet, and described them in more detail to explain the grades that they got. Another document that was prepared and submitted was this one that documented and compared a full-sized pilot window installation to the existing windows in place in the building. A narrative for what was being shown and compared was supplied with each photo. A window manufacturer and unit was selected and the brochure with selections made was also included with the submittal. These we still uh, tend to still get. And finally, a sheet of window details was drawn and submitted that compared the existing historic windows to the proposed window side by side. And we do still accept um, a window details drawing sheet uh, to make sure that the win that the replacement window is compatible with the historic. Once again, the SHPO reviewed the application. However, it was forwarded to the National Park Service without recommendation, which for clarification does not necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. The National Park Service reviewed the documentation and determined that everything was fine except that the vertical dimension of the transom bar of the, of the proposed window was not appropriate and needed to be revised. The consultant and the applicant went back to the manufacturer to work out the transom bar issue and in the end created a transom bar that was acceptable to the Park Service. The other condition concerning the suspended acoustic ceiling was never addressed and the resultant work did cause some concern during the part three review. So now that the work is complete, let's look at the part three, which is the moment of truth. Use the Part 3 form to request approval of an entire completed rehabilitation work. A completed phase of a project, for a completed phase of a project, use the amendment or an advisory determination form. Though this project was phased, it did not seek an advisory determination on either of the phases. The completed project may be inspected by an authorized representative of the Secretary of the Interior to determine if the work meets the standards for rehabilitation. More often than not, that would be me. The, pro the project completed date is the date that all work related to the project was completed. If the project completed completion date and the date the property is placed in service pursuant to IRS regulations are different, the date the project was completed is the date that must be reported on the form. Both the estimated rehabilitation costs and the total estimated costs, which includes the cost attributable to the rehabilitation plus all other project costs must be reported on this form. The estimated rehabilitation costs are defined as the project's qualified rehabilitation expenditures or QREs pursuant to section 47 of the Internal Revenue Code. If the rehabilitation project was phased or involved multiple buildings that were functionally related historically pursuant to 36 CFR part 67, the cost reported on the form must be the total cost for the entire project. On page two, list any additional owners with their addresses and social, and social security or taxpayer identification numbers, which are continued on 
and continue on additional sheets as necessary. Send, a, send photographs taken after completion of the rehabilitation work showing the same views as you did in the part two. This way we can get a direct comparison between the pre-existing conditions and the after conditions to make sure it is in compliance with what was approved and the standards. The set of photographs documenting the condition of the property after the work was complete was submitted along with the Part 3 application form. The photographs sought to duplicate the Part 2 photos as much as possible. Again, accompanying these printed photographs were photo keys that depicted the site and floor plans with photo tags indication, indicating the location the photograph was taken and what direction the camera was pointing. During the initial Part 3 review, a few concerns were raised by the SHPO and the consultant worked to address what they could. One of the concerns was the acoustic drop ceiling that was never addressed in an amendment, even though it was a condition, and another was the physical plant building was not white boxed. This is why it is so important to get everything approved before the work is started or done. As such, when the SHPO issued the recommendation to the Park Service, a note was included about the ceiling issue. However, the recommendation was ultimately a recommendation for approval due to all the other work conforming with the standards and that some of the ceiling condition issues were a pre-construction condition in secondary spaces. When MPS reviewed the completed work, they did make an official comment about the ceilings, saying that though the treatment of the drop ceilings in the apartments does not meet the standards, the overall scope of the project minimally met the standards. So when it was all said and done, the National Park Service certified the rehabilitation project on October 18th, 2019, and the application was able the applicant was able to claim the tax credit. Thank you, and I will now open up for questions and comments. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Okay, well, uh, hearing and seeing none, um, I will let you all go enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again for um, joining us for uh, this month's um, workshops. Um, our next workshops are going to be in May. So um, once again, we will be giving our National Register, our Section 106, or Review and Compliance, and our tax credit um, workshops in May. So if you have anybody who would like to, that you think would benefit from attending our workshops, please make sure that they reach out. Um, yes, Shelby, a recording of the presentations will be available. You should get an email um, when the recording is ready and I've published it. So yes. All right, with that, I will uh, close it out. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a great holidays coming up. Thank you.